One of the reasons that we started opensource.com was to have a way to explain all the great ways that open source works that aren't about software. But in order to be able to do that, you have to be able to explain open source to people who don't know anything about software. And so that's when I came upon the idea of using the very common language of pop culture as a metaphor to explain the principles that we want to promote as open source ideals. Much like software and much like innovation, art is all built on that which came before it. Hunter S. Thompson rewrote by hand The Great Gatsby and A Farewell to Arms before he wrote Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas just to find out what it would feel like to write the great American novel. 10 Things I Hate About You, fun movie with Heath Ledger, was really just Kiss Me Kate, which was really just Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew. The Lion King is just what happens when you have Hamlet in the jungle instead of in Denmark. Whether it's TV, movies, music, video games, internet memes, even lolcats, you can find some common language to explain the principles of open source to the people who don't understand what software is. But instead of talking about open source, you talk about the principles that you're really talking about. Because when you say open source, if they have any notion that that goes along with software, then they're immediately going to think about software, tune you out, because that's a thing that I don't know about. So talk about what you really mean instead of talking about open source. So I'm going to give you a few examples. We're going to go really fast. First of all, Tron. Start, the movie starts off with the guy releasing the source code. We can quibble about the details of whether he stole it or not. But the entire movie is about releasing a piece of code from the grid. It's the entire plot. These are two examples of musicians who are having a lot of success using Creative Commons licenses. On the left, Kurt Smith, who is half of Tears for Fears, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, now works with a woman named Zoe, and he blogs about how their partnership wouldn't be possible without Creative Commons licenses and the sharing that the internet has enabled for them. He has a great piece on there about how uh, he would spend all of his time fighting inadvertent copyright infringement instead of making new music, and he would rather be making music. Brad Sucks, you may not know by name, he has a terrible name, he is a musician who tours with Paul and Storm and Jonathan Coulton, but he also made all the default sound sets in Pigeon, which you probably have heard. Ghost was Nine Inch Nails' first album after their split from Interscope Records. They didn't advertise it at all. The only advertisement, so to speak, was a post from Trent Reznor on their website that said two weeks. That was it. Two weeks later, they put this album up with a pay-what-you-will uh, set. You could get it for free, all the way up to a $300 special edition album that sold out almost instantly. It cost them $20,000 in site upgrades, but within a week, they had made $1.2 million. Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality is fan fiction, but it's awesome fan fiction. That's the only time I will ever say those three words in a row. It's a story about what happens if Harry was raised not by the evil and oppressive uncle who hated him and wanted him to fail in life, but by a really, really smart uncle who was a professor at Oxford. And he teaches him everything about science. And he gets to Hogwarts and he goes, wait, you can't turn into a cat. That kind of defies the laws of physics. And he figures out that if he can master magic and the world of science, he can take over the world. What makes it relevant is that about chapter 22, the author finds out that J.K. Rowling doesn't care if you use her characters in other ways. She's a fan of fan fiction, as long as you don't put them in inappropriate situations. The quantified self is this growing movement that's accompanied with little devices like the Fitbit, which you may know about, things that track your heart rate, how much you're sleeping, how much REM sleep you get, uh, all sorts of things about you through the day. And people are doing all sorts of interesting graphics. And there's one guy who, who creates this fabulous annual report about himself every year. And there's a website at quantifiedself.org, I believe, where they have these three prime questions that you may recognize as exactly what we do when we want to share software. When you want to find out how something got put together, you want to know what you did, how you did it, what did you learn from it, and how can I do it? That's how the quantified self works. And it's actually changing a lot of outcomes and health as well. The Hunger Games, if you've read the books instead of just seeing the movie, is the best example in all of literature of what happens with an exceptional lack of transparency in government. And if you haven't read through the third book, I'm not going to set up the spoilers for you because you're just going to go see the movies. But Parallel is this, which is the Reichstag Dome in Berlin. And it is a real life example of transparency in government. And it was designed to represent transparency in government. And it was set up that way. You can see the bottom. People look down on the parliament. And it was created that way by the designers so that the people would always be above their government, able to see what they were doing, and that the atrocities of the past would never happen again. Reality TV, theoretical meritocracy. But in reality, we know it's all scripted anyway. So my favorite example of meritocracy is Star Trek. Not only do they not care if you're a boy or a girl or what race you are, they don't even care what species you are. There's an entire Next Generation episode called The Measure of a Man in which they put Data, the android, on trial. for being. They, the Starfleet comes along and says, we can take him back, we can take him apart, because he's just a computer, right? And everybody comes along and says, nope, you can't. He's a person to us, and that's important. But just like in a real functioning meritocracy, sometimes you screw up, and a higher power comes along and puts you on trial. Iron Man, absolute best example in the world of rapid prototyping. Guy has a problem, he solves this problem, builds himself a suit. The plans get out there, his enemies build suits too. They even use it against him. Not only that, Iron Man uses KDE 3.5 in his suit. That's amazing Iron Man, number 11. 
Kickstarter example of a functioning meritocracy outside of comic books, Diaspora, an example of what happens when you might have a successful example in your meritocracy, but it falls down on the other side. But these other four examples are good examples of successful Kickstarter projects that in several cases are also very much open source. The Elevation Doc is uh, for iPhones, so we won't count that one, but Muse Open, an open source music project, Punk Mathematics is an open source math book based on punk music, awesome. You can explain collaboration through anything with an ensemble cast, whether that's the Justice League or the Scoobies or the other Scoobies, but the best example for demonstrating collaboration community is the movie Love Actually. And what this does, if you've never seen the movie, is map out the relationships. The movie has about a half a dozen plots and you go through each scene. But as you go through the movie, you discover that the guy over in this plot line has a sister over in this plot line, and the guy that she works with is actually over in that plot line. And that's what this does is map, and you've probably seen this on Facebook, maps of the relationships you have with other people. And that's exactly how communities function. For a long time, I didn't have much to say about gaming and Linux because all we had was Unreal 2004, and that's getting really old now, but we have a lot better examples now. We have World of Goo, which initially wasn't available on Linux, but on the day that it became available for Linux, it accounted for 5% of their downloads in all of history. It was their highest download day ever. Uh, the Humble Bundles, which are uh, a series of releases, they last about two weeks, and you can see this is an example of one. You get uh, five or six or a half a dozen games, and it changes a little bit every time but it's a pay what you will, you can pay zero and get all of these games. But the benefits go to the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Child's Play, which is a charity for children and gaming, so if you don't don donate money for your games, you kind of hate freedom and children. And even better, each time, this is an example from one Humble Bundle, the, the number four one, but every single time those numbers are accurate. Windows users pay about five bucks, Mac users seven or eight, and the Linux users are up for about $12 every single time, proving there is absolutely a market for gaming on Linux. But if you like your gaming to come on paper instead of in the computer, Dungeons and Dragons is now crowdsourcing their fifth edition. Because Dungeons and Dragons is a really, really old game. And the rules from the first edition are nothing like the rules from the fourth edition. And when fourth edition came out, people got really, really mad because it was also really different from the third edition. And so seeing that their market is declining with the rise of video games, Dungeons and Dragons has decided to go to their players and say, you tell us what the rules are for the fifth edition. They're taking it from the public and putting it together into something that's going to, if they're lucky, make everybody happy. If you don't like gaming and you like fashion, I have stories for that too. So these are not the same dress, which may surprise you. On the left is the wedding dress that Fleur wears in one of the Harry Potter movies. On the right is an Alexander McQueen dress from several years earlier. When faced with the question, hey, didn't you totally steal the Alexander McQueen dress? The Harry Potter designer says, no, no, no. These are not the same dress at all. As you can clearly see, my dress has phoenixes, whereas theirs has peacocks. Remember that. <laughs> Fashion design, often, uh, often derivative because there are only so many ways that you can put two sleeves on a shirt, sometimes obviously derivative, like this Jean-Charles de Castelbayac dress. But this, this is an Alexander McQueen runway show from long before that incident happened, which they told the press was explicitly based on the live chess scene in the first Harry Potter movie. Ready Player One, awesome novel that came out last November. It's set in the future and there's this future version of the internet to make this a really, really short description called the Oasis, which in the book he describes as open source, but it's very, very clearly not what we would describe as open source. What that proves to me though is that the words open source are making it out into pop culture now and I think I'd love to talk to him one day. What he really means by that in this book is that it's a place where communities meet. It's where people come together. And that's how open source comes out in this book. The future of innovation really is built on openness. This is a lily pad Arduino, which is for wearable designs and a MakerBot. And it's relevant because the best thing you can put on a MakerBot is an army of Daleks. And what it's leading to is a future in bioprinting. And bioprinting isn't yet open source. But someone asked one of the designers at Clemson University who is working on bioprinting, hey, I have a RepRap. What's the difference between what I have and what you have? And he said, uh, well, bioprinting could absolutely one day be open source because the only difference between what I have and what you have is the material being printed. And what I hear from that is that one day I can print my own bacon. What it also means is that one day we can print our own actors, which means no more movie reboots. We can print our own Shatners, except George Lucas will also be able to print his own Jar Jar Binks. And that is a problem. But that's all I have.